And my, uh, <laughs> my grandparents did not come from Germany. But we're both labor. Yeah, that too. Um, all right. Um, as promised, we're going to uh, deal with the question of transplantation, um, which as uh, I think everyone knows by me, that is not a, uh, a question and not an issue. Um, when Doug initially asked this question, I think we just kind of mentioned something about transplantation a couple weeks ago and uh, other things popped up in between. And uh, since Thursday is the anniversary of uh, my transplant, um, I finally figured out that this is the appropriate uh, week to deal with this. Um, I, uh, I guess before I get into the nitty gritty, I, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what happened at the, uh, when I got my, uh, tr my kidney. Um, the, uh, I had uh, been on, uh, let's see, I, I had uh, issues, well, we, we discovered that I have what's called polycystic kidneys. Uh, that's multiple cysts in each of the kidneys. And um, we just watched it for quite a while. And then um, about eight and a half years ago, we've got actually closer to nine now, um, my doctor said, well, that's it. Uh, we put up a good fight, but you lost uh, time for dialysis. And I went on dialysis and um, I actually did it at home and did that for nine months. And during the course of, the, of that time, I had uh, 17 calls that I, of possible transplants. A um, couple of times I actually was admitted into the hospital. Once I was in the pre-op when the, uh, the surgeon came out and said, sorry, we can't use this kidney, go home. Um, and... Uh, you know, frankly, it was a, I had adopted the attitude like a, uh, like a, an athlete, you know, that you never get too high and you never get too low. And um, I figured I was no worse off than I was uh, before I came into the hospital and we just continued. Um, so back in June of uh, 2012, um, I got a call one Friday night. No, it actually was not Friday night, it was Saturday night, that um, there was a, a kidney available. Was I interested? Yes. Uh, the only thing they could tell me was it was a, a woman, 46 years old, who had an asthma attack and they couldn't revive her. Um, but they weren't sure that they were, the, the uh, kidney would be coming our way. Um, so they, what the, the way this works is that when a kidney becomes available or when any organ, they, there's the waiting list, which is controlled um, <clears throat> by the organization Gift of Life, um, which uh, I'm, it's down on uh, right off um, their their facility is where you get off the expressway, you know, by uh, 95 and 676 <clears throat> downtown by uh, uh, 6th Street, 5th Street, 6th Street. Anyway, way third, down there. Third and Callow Hill. Well, they're on Callow Hill, yeah. Yeah. Um, in any event, they have the they have a list and they first match the blood, the blood type, and we get a call. Are you interested? If you're interested, they do the secondary typing, uh, check for antibodies and whatever else it is that they do. If you've survived that round, um, 
you then are ranked who is the most uh, needy, et cetera, and so forth. And I guess it varies with each one uh, where, where you're ranked, because sometimes I was fifth, sometimes I was uh, a couple of times, I was, well, the 17 times before that I was one or two. Um, remember, there are two kidneys. Um, yeah, you know, I'm down the line. So finally they called me uh, Sunday morning, I get the call and I, they said, well, you are now ranked number three. Um, and we still don't know what's happening, where, where this kidney is going. And they said, I said, okay. Um, later that afternoon, I remember it was about five o'clock, uh, I get a call and they said, um, we're still not sure what's happening, but the doctor says you shouldn't eat anything after midnight tonight, just in case. Um, so the next, that night and the next day, I, I had your site from my mother. Um, so I was in, I went to Minion, I came home and I hadn't heard anything, you know, they, they had gotten the call early in the morning and I called back, I said, well, what's going on? And I said, ah, we still don't know anything. Well, about a half hour later, they called me back and they said, um, we're still not sure, but the doctor wants you in the hospital. Uh, so I went over to HUP um, and they admitted me. And I was sitting around and uh, they started doing the pre-testing and all day long is we're not sure, we're not sure. So it turns out, which I found out later, that what was going on is that the person who was number one was sick and they were waiting to see if he would he or she i don't know uh would be eligible for the surgery and it turns out he wasn't therefore i moved up and they said okay we're a go and this was uh by this point it was monday afternoon um the surgery started at uh four o'clock in the afternoon and uh that's the, uh, and here I am, I guess that's that, you know, and um, so like I say, it, it, I, I have never followed up to find out who my donor was, or so I know anything about her, the actually, uh, the only thing that I could say for sure other than what I've said already is that she checked off organ donor on her driver's license. Um, uh, my and I, these three others uh, benefit. Uh, I don't know how many organs were actually uh, contributed. So since then, um, I'm on a regimen of a whole bunch of pills, um, doing, uh, you know, I guess I have a certain, you know, what I consider minor issues is reaction to some of the medication. Um, but I'm, uh, except for some old arthritis injuries of, you know, fully uh, functional, functional, at least I think that Carmen's not in the room, I can say that. Uh, in any event, you know, that's, uh, that's how I got here. So I thought if we, uh, want to look at what, you know, Halacha says about transplant. Um, give the shortened version, which is, yes, uh, obviously here I am. Um, and the simple way of stating it is all con comes under the rubric of pikuach nefesh, uh, you know, saving, saving a soul. And it dawned on me that while we um, talk about this principle a lot, we don't necessarily uh, always look at where it comes from and what's the context in which we're given this principle. So on the screen, I have the, the passage from Sanhedrin, the Mishnah in Sanhedrin. Um, chapter 4, Mishnah 5. 
how did they admonish witnesses in capital cases? Everybody's saying, what does this have to do with transplants? Aha, we'll get to that. All right. They brought them in and admonished them saying, perhaps you will say something that is only a supposition or hearsay or secondhand, or even from a trustworthy man. Or perhaps you do not know that we shall check you with examination and inquiry. Know moreover that capital cases are not like non-capital cases. In non-capital cases, a man may pay money and so make atonement. But in capital cases, the witness is answerable for the blood of him that is wrongfully condemned and the blood of his descendants that should have been born to him to the end of the world. For, okay, so this is what they're saying that the, uh, you need to tell a witness in a case. And I said, so we have found it with Cain that murdered his brother, for it says, the bloods of your brother cry out. Um, blah, 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 blah. In the Hebrew, it says, Demei achicha tzoakim. Okay, and the Mishnah goes on to say, it does not say the blood, blood being singular, but rather the bloods of your brother. Demei is plural. If it would have been just singular, it would say dam achicha. Okay, meaning his blood and the blood of his descendants. Another saying, in other words, another interpretation is the bloods of your brother, that is that his blood was cast over trees and stone. Therefore, but a single person was created in the world to teach that if any man has caused a single life to perish from Israel, he is deemed by scripture as if he had caused the whole world to perish. And anyone who saves a single soul from Israel, he is deemed by scripture as if he had saved a whole world. Okay, so from this Mishnah and from the passage in Bereshit, we get the idea of the blood of a single person it is critical because it's not just the person that's involved, but it's his future generations that which will come from him uh, that we are concerned with. And again, this is, uh, I think this is a pretty, pretty well known phrase too, that if a single person was created in the world to teach that if any man has caused a single life to perish from Israel, he is deemed by scripture as if he had caused the whole world to perish. Okay, just the rest of the Mishnah, um, which is also very good. It said again, but a single person was created for the sake of peace among humankind, that one should not say to another, my father was greater than your father. Again, but a single person was created against the heretics, so they could not say, there are many ruling powers in heaven. Again, but a single person was created to proclaim the greatness of the Holy One, blessed be he. For humans stamp out many coins with one seal and they are all like one another. But the King of Kings, the Holy Blessed One has stamped every human with the seal of the first man, yet not one of them are like another. Therefore, everyone must say, for my sake was the world created. And perhaps you would, you witnesses would say, why should we be involved with this trouble? Was it not said? He being the witness, whether he has seen or known, if he does not speak it, then he shall bear his iniquity. And if perhaps you witnesses would say, why would we be guilty of the blood of this man? Was it not said, when the wicked perish, there is rejoicing. Okay, again, the, the Mishnah casts this in terms of, of what of how we uh, take care of uh, getting witnesses to uh, to te to act in court but it brings a whole lot into it and a lot that can and has been inferred from these statements on um, the one about only a single person being created so as not to create 
you know, take your pick of which story you want there, because uh, there's a whole bunch, and I believe everyone uh, is important. As a matter of fact, I think uh, one of the sessions we had last week after uh, the rioting, somebody, I think it was Annie, uh, used one of those quotes to, to show how this is something we're all concerned with. Uh, and it's not just the fact that one person died, but a whole bunch of other things. Okay, any uh, questions or reactions to the Mishnah? Uh, so Mort, I, I, I don't usually comment, but this is a very interesting discussion because um, I was always taught that in addition to saving a life, we're also required to keep the body whole. Aha, uh -huh. we're going to get to that. Okay, great. Okay. Um, wait, let me, I covered over my text. Let me just point out, um, it says, um, uh, I didn't highlight the Hebrew. Uh, and if anyone who saves a single soul from Israel, he is deemed by scripture as if he has saved the whole world. Um, so remember, this is how we get the principle of kuach nefesh keneged kulam. Uh, the saving of a life uh, trumps everything. Mort, <coughs> Mort can yeah. I ask? Um, <coughs> so this, this specific statement applies only to a single life from Israel, but not from all humankind, correct? Well, and how do, uh, and how do you, I, I, um, how do you take that? I, I would say that um, the rabbis had a, uh, a a bias. Let me put it that way. And clearly, they they were reflecting a Jewish point of view. Um, if your question is, can we apply this to non-Jews? And I have no problem with that. Uh, well, of course, if we find that we can be in a situation where anything that we do or can assist with that would help uh, another person, then, then, uh, then, then fine. I, I guess what comes to mind, the first example I can think of is all my, um, shall we say, observant or orthodox friends who are doctors, and when they get called to go to the hospital on Shabbat or on holidays, um, they can justify it in their mind by pikuach nefesh. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think even though the text is talking about, uh, you know, Israel, it, it can be applied. Okay. Um, so, the concerns about organ donation is exactly the things that David asked. Um, there are, I would say, two, two major issues that we deal with. Um, one is, um, is when, let me, uh, how do I put this? Uh, the first issue is when do we determine the moment of death? Um, in other words, if we're taking, if we're using a uh, cadaver donor, at one point, can we say, okay, uh, the person's gone and uh, it's time for us to now harvest whatever we can. Um, and of course, within the rabbinic text, um, there's a difference of opinion. Um, there's one side that says um, that the both the brain and the heart have to stop functioning. That there be no, no breathing, no physical signs of any activity in the body. Well, from a 
practical standpoint, that's a pro that's problematic in the terms of transplantation because the organs still need that the blood circulating and um, if they can get oxygen, um, which may be problematic, um, in order for them to be suitable for transplantation. Some organs more so than, uh, than others. Um, on the other hand, um, they're, at least to me, the prevailing, or at least the majority opinion, is that the point of death is determined by what we call brain, uh, what are they, what's the term I'm, I'm forgetting here? It's when there's no um, the cessation, irreversible cessation of brain stem functions. Um, when, you know, the brain stem can stop functioning and yet the heart can still keep beating. And the, um, in some cases, I think, the uh, lungs can still keep uh, pumping. Um, so it, <clears throat> it's the brain stem um, issue, the function is that to determine it. That's why uh, rabbis have decided that if a person is kept, their heart is kept going by artificial means, uh, then that, that uh, that can be done if it, as long as it's to improve the chances of successful transplantation. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Um, the the subcategory um, on this issue is what about organs from live donors? Um, again, there is a slight difference of opinion, although most uh, post scheme I have come around, at least those that are written about, uh, and when they, they said originally that, hey, when we leave this world, we have to go with all the body parts that we came in with, uh, are coming around to say, well, that's not necessarily the case. Um, first of all, you have um, situations where people have uh, amputations or other um, removal, the removal of other uh, tissues or organs. And at one point they say, well, somebody has to keep track of where these are so when the and the person finally passes away, you have to take all those, those body parts and bury it all together. And they, uh, I think we've discovered that's uh, impractical and uh, is not a really point of concern. So the, the issue with, with live donors um, is that what is the danger of the surgery to the person who's making the donation? Some donations can be done with very, I mean, every surgery has a risk. <coughs> and, excuse me, and that, um, that we're aware of. And every, um, every type of procedure has certain type of consequences that may or may not occur. But, but clearly there are procedures where the risk factors are much lower and aren't as dangerous to the person undergoing the procedures. You know, prime example is kidney donation is the least, uh, according to you know, I, I'm not going to quote a medical authority on this because the source I used didn't quote them. Um, I should say sources, I had a couple. Of them. But kidneys are the least problematic because people can exist with one kidney. Um, the surgery to remove the kidney is um, not, not as risky as other donors. Uh, clearly, uh, some 
some organs, you know, we wouldn't consider for live, uh, you know, donation, you know, the heart. Um, some, actually there are some questions about lungs or parts of the lungs. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly, you know, where that stands, but uh, the, the point is, if it's dangerous, if it's going to prove to be an extreme danger to the person who is making the donation, then all authorities agree it is not to be done. Uh, if the risk, you know, lightens up, then yes, we can go ahead. Um, so I, I, it comes down to again is that, um, and I know this was the impression that many had of the question of transplantation, certainly in Israel, where many of the um, the Orthodox, many in the Orthodox rabbinate for many years uh, prohibited uh, transplants. Uh, and finally, they came around and saw the, um, the positive side on it and, you know, then approved uh, of um, you know, of, of transplantation and that it is, as far as I know, is uh, done um, in many places in, in Israel. Um, I'm sure there are still enclaves of some people who say, no, you can't, um, but I think they are in the small minority. Okay, uh, two other um, quick issues. Uh, one was the a question that was brought up of whether a person who is gives a um, a it allows uh, you know, not the words not I'm blanking on the word again. A person who donates an organ while he's still alive can that person be buried in a Jewish cemetery? Because there are there's historical precedent for some people who, in some cemeteries, that certain people who committed infractions of uh, uh, certain types in uh, halachic infractions were not allowed burial in Jewish cemeteries. Uh, such if you look carefully at the halacha there, uh, people who commit suicide are not allowed in the cemeteries, uh, although there's a uh, for all of these, there are some, so you can find a little bit in the text that gives you an out to say, oh yeah, okay, we can go ahead and do it. Um, I mean, for the issue of suicide, uh, the, uh, the rabbi said, you know, um, if someone was not in his right mind and committed one of these infractions, well, then of course, go ahead and, and bury him in the cemetery. And so the, ob the obvious corollary is that someone who commits suicide was obviously not in his right mind, otherwise he wouldn't have done it. Um, very simplistic, I know, and I'm doing it real quick, but you know, that's the basis of it. So there's um, no exceptions to that? That's just, if somebody's committed suicide, it's, it's fine. They can be buried in the cemetery. There's Let me put it this way. I, I have never heard in modern times of someone who has committed suicide that was not allowed to be buried. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I, I think that covers it, right? Um, even in orthodox orthodoxy? Even in orthodoxy. Good. Good. Um, and lastly, the one issue that comes up is, can you sell an organ for money? Um, very often we hear of uh, schemes of people who uh, get involved in these uh, uh, activities where they can uh, give a, 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 an organ and get paid a lot of money, uh, you know, for the sake of doing it. Um, I, um, the, uh, Technically, I think it comes under, well, 
halachically, I don't think we can find anything that says, no, you can't. But as I've heard several times in the past week, we have the principle of just because you could doesn't mean that you should. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much the, the, going, uh, the going concern on that issue. So bottom line, again, is the principle um, uh, is, is above all, um, clearly leads us to, um, to accept the idea of transplantation and um, we go ahead and do it. And I forgot one other quote, which I just saw in my notes here. That let me just mention that uh, brief, briefly. There's another. There's another uh, quote which uh, you know which uh, helps us out in this issue, which is "Do not stand idly by." In other words, if um, we see you know the. the the context is, if you see some, some troubles happening, don't stand idly by and just say, well, someone else will take care of it. Uh, if you can help, um, certainly by all means, uh, without endangering yourself, uh, certainly jump in and do it. And when it comes to uh, transplantation, there are, uh, there are rabbis who said this certainly applies as well. Okay, um, any questions, comments? I could say my alarm just went off in the other room time for my medications, but I can wait a couple minutes. Uh, or, uh, Mort, hi, this is Sue. Hi, Sue. Um, this has been fascinating for me. Um, and I have a, sort of a comment just something information to add. Yeah. Um, I had a tr what they call a transplant, but it was a totally, um, it was my own stem cells. So it did not, I did not deal with all of those halachic issues. Uh, not that I would have thought of it probably at the time, but anyway, um, once the the, the new stem cells, my own new stem cells were coming into my body. <clears throat> the whole medical establishment has a term for that. They call it day one. So, and it's, I've, I mean, I've heard that term in lots of, you know, for the same process in, in many different venues, you know. So that is a, a term in my, you know, in my vocabulary now. Well, uh, I, I think it's not. Uh, not the same. I, I, really, it's not. It's uh, I, what I was going to say, that term is not unique to, to stem cell transplantation. Ah, okay. Or, impl or implantation, I guess, also the word. Um, uh, I know people who consider the anniversary of... Um, of their surgery as their new birthday. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, yes. Because of the fact that my surgery took place on the day of my, mother, my mother's yard site, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, uh, I say, um, on that day, I remember two women who gave me life. Wow. And um, probably we'll talk about a little bit more on Thursday. Um, I light two yard site candles. Mm. Um, one for my daughter and one, and one for my mother. And um, I observe it that way. So yes, day one, rebirth, new birth. Okay. Take your pick. They're all great. Um, when they work and they're successful, Absolutely. it's all true. And let us just be happy with it. Yes. You got it. 
Yasher Koach Mort, that was really interesting. Oh, thank you. Yasher Koach. Yes, thank you very, very much. Okay. Okay. I, um, about uh, 10 years ago, I was in a restaurant and I had fractured my foot. So my foot was up on this booth uh, on the thing. And there was a woman sitting next to me that I didn't know. And I could see she started choking. And I said, are you okay? Can you talk? So here I am with my leg up and I just said, and I, and it was like Mrs. Doubtfire, the piece of shrimp just flew out of her mouth across the room. Ah, only uh, reason for not eating shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was so exhilarating. It was so amazing. So one of my friends, family member is um, married to the son of Heimlich, uh, you know, who invented the Heimlich. And they said he never, he died in the last five years. He never performed the Heimlich maneuver on anyone until a couple of years before he died. And he died like in his 90s. It was the last year, I think, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, in the last year or two. Um, but, you know, it just, it's like maybe that's something we could do it as a synagogue too, just have some basic, you know, training. I mean, I've done that at other shuls, but it was amazing. I mean, I had learned it a gazillion years ago, but it was just like, wow. I don't even want to be, well, I have a quite, one quite go to that restaurant that, that you went to. Um, I, I, um, I, I administered a Heimlich at a book group meeting once, but um, what I wanted to say was, was uh, when I hear this, um, you know, my, my, grand, my, my daughter had a liver transplant at 13 months old, and um, and when I hear, and my mother was, um, you know, she believes that, you know, you, you don't, you don't mess with this stuff. You don't, you don't take an organ out and, uh, until her granddaughter needs one. And then that sort of changed her, her attitude. And, and uh, I, it just occurs to me, and, and, and I, this brings in also the recent decision about being able to use electronic devices on, on Shabbos that when when halacha engages with the real world sometimes uh, I'm left to question why you know why was this rule there in the first place I mean why why are we with, with transplants when people are saying well uh, you know you have to leave the world with what you came in and all of these kind of very abstract philosophical positions that just crumble when they engage the real world and what's really happening. And, and I, it sort of annoys me at some, you know, to some extent it annoys me that, that we are, um, that there are people, I mean, it's, it's, it's maybe, I don't want to say it's the same thing, but maybe just a couple of steps removed from a politician telling you maybe you should gargle Clorox, you know, people who really have no uh, expertise or no way of, of anticipating where the world is going in a few hundred years uh, have made these decisions. Well, go ahead. Well, our, my, my reaction to that is that uh, I think and you, you pre pretty much have to go uh, decision by decision that I think in each case, there was something going on, something in the olden times, which was of concern and, and caused someone to come up with these um, rulings in the first place. Uh, I think if you wanna look at the idea of, you know, this principle of you have to go out whole is probably reflective of some type of practice that was going on where where people maimed their bodies deliberately uh, in whichever way, which I, I, I think we know happened and perhaps is still happening in some places. Um, you know, even, uh, I, know, I don't know if it's still going on where the, instead of tattoos, people used to uh, use hot irons to brand themselves. So, um, I think, yeah, I think in those, 
those type of practices can easily give rise to a question of, well, we don't want to mess with the body. Um, you have a body, it was made in the image of God. Um, if we believe God is, is beautiful, then your body is beautiful. I have an Orthodox friend who, who always said, always argued with me. He'd say, you know, why, why are we reinterpreting that, that we ought to defer to the people who were there when these rules were made? And my response to that is always the world is very different now, and perhaps we need different rules. And, right. and I'm only responding to say, what was it like that started in the first place? And now if we think differently, and certainly we're interpreting it differently. I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah, I just wonder why we why we pay any deference to that in the first place when I mean transplantation, organ transplantation, you know, when when, when certain rules were made, it was a hundred hundreds of years off. And and why why do we look at that and interpret something today in light of in light of something that had nothing to do with it and, and was based on nothing even remotely resembling it. And the principle, I mean, you know, theology and philosophy, that's fine. But as I say, when it engages with the real world. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I think we would have to conclude though, that in, I feel that in order to understand uh, what we're saying, what we're doing, we have to look at what happened. Um, who was that guy who said, if you don't study the past, you're doomed to repeat it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. But on the other hand, uh, once, we, once we do this, once we talk about it a little bit, and now when it comes to practical concerns um, of what's going to happen as soon as we turn, this, uh, turn our computers off, ah, so what? You know, if there's a, an organ available and somebody needs it, go ahead, give it to them. Um, but yet, when we're sitting here in, in, in dealing with, uh, shall we say, our intellectual pursuits, then we have to deal with the past. We have to deal with what they did, why they did it, and how they did it. And if we come up with different conclusions and different applications, uh, I think the word is amen, so be it. Yeah. Is there anything, though, but is there anything that, any argument that could have been made a thousand years ago that would have changed your mind about the wisdom of organ transplantation? Today? Yeah. Uh, no. No. That, that's, no. Like, that's but, but on the other hand, I'm not upset that I know what happened, and I'm no. not upset in the fact that, I, you know, that I have an idea of where these sources came from, what they were dealing with, and why they came up with it. And I'm not opposed to that either. I'm a student of history, but, but um, I just think that, that when we pay deference to that, when we, when we factor that into the equation of something we need to decide today, then I think, that's, that's, I think it's misguided. But. Well, isn't one of the principles of the conservative movement that the past should have a vote, but not a veto? No, no, that's a reconstruction. That's a reconstruction. <laughs> Same thing. That's all right. You know, but the bottom line of Judaism is, you know, to save a life. So, yeah. You know, it's oh. like, hello. <laughs> Do we need Judaism to tell us that? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I, I don't. You don't. Friend, and it's like, come on, are you kidding me? Hey, I, if I couldn't go back and talk about the past, what would we have talked about today? No, yeah. what, if I were talking about the past, I just don't think we ought to factor the past into real life. This, I mean, and that's in this sense when when we have people sitting around and philosophizing and theologizing and whatever else they do, I don't think that has much relevance to a real world decision of life and death today. Uh, I, I'd like to, to end with, you know, uh, a, a story. Uh, you guys know Jan Weinstock, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, Natalie shaking her head, no. You know, next time we're able to gather together in Shul, uh, you know, we'll introduce we'll, you. We'll introduce you to Jan. Okay. Jan's a member of the Shul, and she works for a gift for life. Um, 
it was uh, the year after my transplant that uh, I, there, there was a snowstorm on a Saturday morning. And it happens that um, there was a man, uh, there was a, a sporting club over on North Broad, right by- uh, The Bellevue. What? No, right. not at Bellevue, on, on north, north of- Broadwood, uh, that was years ago. Well, it wasn't that long ago, but there was one that was uh, right across from, uh, what's the Catholic high school there, the Latin? Roman Catholic. Well, whatever the name of the place was, a guy was there and- uh, Borden Pond. Yeah, Barn Vine. And um, yeah. uh, he collapsed uh, in the gym and, and died. And um, he wanted, he had put down that he wanted to be a tissue donor. Um, the family, because of the storm, their, excuse me, the, the daughter of the man was stuck in New York and couldn't get down here to Philadelphia. And told the people at Gift of Life that they wanted the, um, they wanted the body to be blessed before anything was done to the body to take out any of the tissues or whatever else he was don uh, donating. So they called me, Jan called me and said, uh, can you help out? And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I said, what does this mean? But I figured, uh, you know, don't stand idly by. So I said, okay. And I went down there. And first of all, that facility down there is something right out of one of those, um, you know, spy thrillers, you know, when you have all the screens around the edge of the room with different things going on and, and people sitting at rows and rows of computers, um, you know, controlling what's up there and, 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 and interpreting the data. That's what this place does. Um, so I go, you know, I say, you know, what am I going to do? So I, I grabbed my uh, rabbi's manual, went down there, said a couple of Psalms, and then, um, then told them, okay, fine, I'm done. And then uh, called the family and said, all right, you know, it, uh, I did what I need, what I could. And just the joy and the, the sounds of relief that were at the other end of the phone were um, not only palatable, but uh, were, was, was quite amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I walked away with the feeling that sometimes it's not just what we do, um, but when we do it and how we do it, that uh, becomes important and uh, is meaningful to people. And it's, uh, it's, it goes right along with all the, uh, the stories of you know, different transplants and how people got them, what they got, and other things. And, uh, obviously, you can see this is also something I like talking about. Thank you very, very much. Yes, thanks, Mort. Thank you, Mort. I have one question. Oh, one comment. Mort, yeah. can you hear me? Mort, can you hear me? Go ahead again. Go ahead. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Okay, here, just one thing. I remember years ago, when I was a young one, uh, back in confirmation class years, many, you know, BZBI, it was, uh, Rabbi McGill said, you know, if, if, you can, if someone dies due, with, due to a suicide, all right, they should be buried in the Jewish cemetery, but at the far end of the field. Uh -huh. They wait for everybody else. That, that, that was a practice that, uh, I don't know if it was officially terminated. Oh, okay. Uh, but I know that, um, at least in my experience, it's observed more in the breach than in the practice. Um, um, I think now the, um, the sessions I attended when we learned those uh, practices, yeah, we're now saying we're now uh, su supplanted by the principle of maybe we really should take into account 
the survivors. Uh huh. How are they going to feel? And and and, yeah. and what's what's their embarrassment when they go to the edge of the cemetery where I'm going right. into the cemetery? Uh, yeah. Or whatever. Uh, and I know that's the uh, what I have dealt. What I was. Uh, well, let me just say what we discussed, what I learned, and I certainly would go along with that. Uh, right now, I am uh, not in the loop of any of this anymore, but uh, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. What well, uh, I guess also, if you buy a plot for somebody, you know, way in advance, you know, you you spend several thousand dollars for the you know the site, the plot, and you're not going to use it for him, you know, with her. It's um, that well, presents that's, that's awesome. That's also, I, and now I'll, I'll make another plug. Um, there was an organization in town called B'nai Chaim Social. Um, it started out as a Landsmannschaft group, you know, yeah. people from, you know, I, I think their, their office is up in the, um, what's the JCC up in the Northeast? The Klein Center. They're up in the Klein Center. Uh, and I believe their lifetime membership is now $500. And for $500, you get a plot. Uh, you know, you get a plot, you get, uh, they supply also different services, you know, the, the limo and other things uh, for yeah. the funeral. Uh, you still have to pay for the funeral, but they give you a plot and a few other things. So uh, I, I put in my pitch for them, um, you know, Carmen and I are both uh, lifetime members. We have been since we, since we heard about them. Uh, oh, yeah, thanks to Rube Rothbard. I know Elton. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I remember, I remember Rube. Well, Rube, 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 not, Rube, not Rube, 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 right? It's yeah, like, he belongs with that. He belongs with that. Rube belongs with that organizations. Yeah, well, I, he he pushed the B'nai Chaim social, not just as a, uh, you know, because they, you know, Goldstein's obviously does a lot of work with them, but uh, yeah. Uh, Mark, what's the name of the organization? B'nai Chaim Social. Okay. Um, if you have trouble finding them, um, you know, let me know and I'll, I'll dig up some of the uh, information I have on it. Oh, but the thing is, you don't know where your plot is. It could be out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you you okay. don't know exactly. Well, that's not completely true. Um, you can reserve for another, um, well, I don't know what the current price is, but you can reserve a plot. You know, for example, when my father passed away, um, the, we, we paid and reserved the plot right next to him for my mother. Uh, so they're, they're together and they are in. Um, oh. Uh, oh, I g gave you the wrong one. All right, what's the name of the cemetery? They, they have two cemeteries, one up in the Northeast and one out in Springfield. So, That's Mount Sharon in Springfield. Yeah, Mount Sharon. Mount yeah. Sharon and uh, where my parents are and uh, King David up, uh, up in the Northeast. Yeah. Yeah, I know him. Okay. Yeah, okay. And did you find anything or? Yeah, I'm putting it in the chat box. I did the wrong thing. It's Chaim Social. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's on Jameson Avenue. I have a feeling that if you call that number, you get a answering machine and they'll get back to you. And, and by the way, they sponsor, I don't know. I haven't heard lately. They used to sponsor a concert once a month. <laughs> but, uh, okay. I, I haven't gotten the newsletter. They don't send out a newsletter anymore, but. Uh, they would do a whole bunch. It's a social club after all. You know. <laughs> okay, everybody. Enough. Okay. So long, Good everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 B